Afghanistan Project podcast. I'm your host, Beth Bailey, and I'm excited to bring on tonight's guest, Michael DeSirio, whose 15-year Army infantry career included two combat deployments to Afghanistan, one to Aruzgan and Kandahar provinces between 2010 and 2011, and a 2013 tour to Wardak province. Michael's currently the operations NCOIC for the U.S. Military Academy at West Point, and uh, I'm just really excited to talk to you today about those deployments, Michael. Thanks for being here. Absolutely. I'm really excited to be here. It's going to be yeah, fun. It is going to be fun. Um, you guys missed a whole lot of awesome background talk <laughs> before yeah. we got started. It's like yeah. the, new, the new podcast plan is we, we do all the cool stuff before I start pressing. Yeah. Because why not? Um, yeah, right. Right. So let's talk about, you know, that first deployment. Where are you at in your military career? What's going on? What was the pre-deployment training like? And what were your thoughts on going to Afghanistan before you got there? Yeah, so I was uh, I was in Second Striker Cavalry Regiment based in uh, Vilsack, Germany. Um, I got there in like January '09. They had just gotten back from a, I believe, a 15 month deployment to Iraq. That was ultra kinetic, um, and I came in as a, a 23, almost 24 year old private E1 uh, to to guys that were like hardened combat veterans that were much younger than I was. Um, but I knew what I was getting into. So I, I just took it very humbly and like I have two ears and one mouth for a reason. So I listened twice as much as I spoke. Um, and I was just, I was just one of the good privates, I guess. Like I just kind of kept my mouth shut and did what I was told. So I didn't get in any trouble or anything. Um, while all of my peers got dusted off every day, I, was older so i just played the game um but the train up was it was pretty good i'll give it like they were coming from iraq and then transitioning to go to afghanistan now it's a completely different battlefield we're not no urban environment we're out in the mountains and stuff um but they did a pretty good job of like getting us ready the pre-deployment train up we did all kinds of training rotations to Hohenfels, um, out into Grafenbeer for live fires. Uh, but a lot of it was on more so the humanitarian, um, the training that Afghan National Army and Afghan National Police, uh, kind of like the human element of war. So as, as a private, um, it was kind of weird. Um, I thought we were, you know, going to just be going and killing bad guys. Um, but it seemed like we were going to be like, shaking hands and kissing babies, kind of being more like mediators and politicians and, and all this, uh, than really like going to war. Um, but I got there, it was, I believe it was like March or April of 2010. Uh, I, we flew into Kandahar airfield and that was like crazy. Uh, I remember my buddy Casey Lyons, <laughs> we got off the, the C-17 on the airfield and I like pull my camera out, you know, like the old digital cameras. I mean, this is 2010 and like, I'm taking pictures and I'm like, this is so crazy. Like it was so hot. I'll, I, I remember the exhaust from the jet was like almost like air conditioning compared to what like the heat was like on the airstrip. It was so hot. Um, and he, I remember I was like taking pictures and he like smacked it on my hand. He's like, you can't be taking pictures on the airfield. Well, it's all secret, you know, whatever. I don't know if that's true or not, but like, whatever. I just remember that getting yelled at first thing off the aircraft. I'm already getting yelled at. Um, but like we got there, we did a bunch of integration stuff. And it's, it's all stupid, really. It's just like, I mean, it was, it was good to like, kind of get like an orientation of like where we are, what's going on and all, but it was really way above. I was just a team leader at this point. It was way above my pay grade. Um, but we got there we were there a couple, couple weeks, maybe waiting for, you know, all the officers to sign for the vehicles and everything. Uh, and then we found out we were moving up to this fob called uh, Fob Frontenac, which I believe was still in Kandahar. I don't remember. Um, but we were going to cover down on somebody else's battle space until uh, I believe it was our third squadron showed up. So I, we got up there, we got our vehicles. And that's actually where we signed for the vehicles, I believe. And we were there for, I think, like two weeks. Um, and, of course, I had no idea what was going on. I was just like, let's do this, you know, whatever. I just 
what do you want me to do? Okay. And I just went and did it. So, um, we were doing like dismounted patrols and stuff, um, through like some great, like it was crazy, like knee deep water, like where they, they flood like the field. Um, but it's terrifying because the Taliban will like put like anti-personnel IEDs and mines down in the water and you can't see it. So it's, I mean, like it's, it's terrifying. Um, but like, we're just walking through there and I'm talking to the guys of the unit that we're, we're leaving. And they're like, yeah, the, the grenadiers don't carry the 320. They carry shotguns because the fighting such close quarters and that environment that like a, a grenade launcher, a 40 millimeter grenade launcher is no good there. Like a shotgun's more advantageous. And I'm like a shotgun dude. Like I've hunted deer before with a shotgun, like, 50 feet and like you're praying that you're going to hit this thing like and you're saying a shotgun's more effective like I, it blew my mind um but we were there ripping out with this unit for probably about two weeks before the other unit came to relieve us um and i i remember <laughs> we went to this uh it's a checkpoint as i don't remember it was a checkpoint and a number checkpoint 13 or 23 i don't remember um but I'll never forget sitting there like we're all getting ready to go to sleep and we're all laying on cots. We're all laying. It was a platform, though, that was like a two by eight tall and it was just plywood and no roof. And laying there at night, we're all smoking cigarettes, just looking up. At, and i would never seen so many stars in my life. And I'm from southeast Ohio. It's not like I'm not from like a I'm from cornfields and cattle like it's not populated but I never seen that many stars. And then we all, you know, we're we've never been <laughs> anywhere like this before. And we all grab our nods and we're looking up at the stars at night. And it was just like, I'll never forget. It was like one of the most beautiful things I've ever seen, but like, it's like a beautiful disaster in a sense. Like it was just so beautiful, but like I'm in the middle of a war and torn country. Like it was kind of like my first reality check of like, Oh my God, like this is super cool. But then two three five minutes later we hear the afghan police like bringing this detainee in and taking him to a room and then hearing screams and all this other stuff and we have no idea it's like that's not our thing so we're not like gonna be a part of it but like i can just imagine what they were doing to that guy um and it was just like that was like my first night in afghanistan you know like out in sector and i'm like oh my god what what is this um but after we're down there at, at i think it was checkpoint 18 if i i keep oh well, it's gonna bug me if i can't remember what it was called um but after that that's when we made the move up north from kandahar to Orzgon, um and we we're at um fob terran um and that fob was well the province as a whole was they this is what they told us was the most advanced in Afghanistan in terms of elections, schools, all that sort of infrastructure and all that. Um, and it really didn't have a lot of Taliban influence, um, which to an infantryman, to a young infantryman without a combat patch, without a combat infantryman's badge, like that's not what we want to hear. We want to hear like, we're getting into it every day. It's a gunfight every day. Like, you know, we're killing the enemy every single day. Um, and we show up and it's kind of like, uh, enjoy your 12 month deployment. Like it's going to be chill. Um, I was in first platoon at the time, um, in first platoon and the headquarters platoon stayed on the fob and then our, uh, second, third, and we had an MGS platoon, which is, we had tankers cause we were strikers. Um, we had tankers integrated in the company as well. They all went to a cop and I can't remember the name. I'm sure to bar. There it is. I knew I'd remember it. Cop to bar. Um, but we were taking this battle space over from the Dutch. The Dutch had, at, this was the last units that uh, were there. They were pulling completely out of the war. They were done. Um, so we were taking over their battle space and we were there with a bunch of Aussies. Um, and the Aussies were dope. They were such cool dudes. Like they're, they're awesome. They were great to work with. So they were all like super bros. They all wanted to be there. Um, they were, they were, very passionate about what they were doing. Um, but it was pretty boring 
honestly. Um, for us down on the fob, we were living a good life. I had a bunk. I didn't have a, uh, I did have a, a bunk mate. He was the other team leader in my squad, but like, we didn't really have to worry about it. We went to the gym, we went on a patrol, and then like we would commandeer a bus that was right hand drive um, and stick shift, which is crazy. So gas, brake, and clutch are still the same, but you shift with your left hand. And I was the only one that knew how to drive a stick shift. So I always got stuck driving the bus because 101st Aviation was there and they had a good uh, DFAC. Our DFAC was ran by like, I don't know who, it was all like curry though. Every meal, breakfast, lunch, and dinner was curry. It was so terrible. Um, but we would always run over to the 101st DFAC and their star major hated us because we were over there eating their food. Um, but a lot of the stuff we were doing in the beginning when we were still in Urzgan was, was partnership stuff. We go out to different A and P checkpoints, uh, A and P police stations and, um, we would do training with them. We would do react to contact drills with them. We would do some, some close quarter marksmanship, uh, CQB close quarter battle stuff, like inner and clearing rooms. Um, nothing too crazy because even, even teaching them how to PT, like to do physical training was like, I mean, it was, it was, it was humorous watching some trying to teach somebody how to do a jumping jack that like is, it's it's hilarious they're the most uncoordinated people i've ever met in my life um i mean just like one arm one leg at a time is ridiculous um but we would do a lot of training and then like some joint patrols day and night we couldn't do a lot of night stuff though because they didn't have night vision um so a lot of the patrols would be during the day and they were really just presence patrols um every once in a while like for the first couple months we might get a uh there's an ied um which we were finding them the right way luckily enough um the locals there we had like kind of won them over and i say we as like us and the afghans um to the point that they wanted to side with us more than the taliban and they would call us and be like hey there's an ied here we'd show up and there would be an ied um and we'd blow it in place and like we, we'd go back to the to the checkpoint and uh hang out there for a little bit, talk to the, the elders if they were around or whatever. Um, and then go back to the fob. Um, it wasn't real crazy. Um, even during fighting season, it wasn't bad. We didn't have a bunch of IEDs, at least from my platoon. Um, now second and third platoon, um, up at the cop, actually, I think third platoon might've been on the fob with us. It might've just been second and MGS up at the cop. Um, they would get some pop shots and stuff. Um, since they were farther away from the fob, they knew that like the uh, the helicopters and the aircraft and stuff like weren't immediately available. Um, so they they would get into little skirmishes, nothing crazy. I mean, there was never there was never like a big gunfight that I can remember. Um, even the first time I got shot at, it was only a couple pop shots um it was never sustained it was always it was really harassing fire um it wasn't it wasn't too kinetic um there was uh some aussie special uh special operations guys up there task force 66 i believe was who it was and those dudes would we'd hear them getting into it but they were going door to door kicking doors in and like hitting high value targets and different target packages that they they were briefed on but it for us it was really we were more of a deterring uh element out there uh and more of a um let's help the afghans get out there and push them a little bit more um when we would do patrols it was almost like one for one there'd be one afghan for every one of us and they would walk with us um and they were always pretty good it was never i was never worried um about any green on blue on this deployment um but it wasn't even really a thing we heard of either uh there's a couple operations that we did um with some big operations where we i remember one we did my platoon um i have a picture of me with a before picture is me standing on top of this mountain and i'm smiling and everything's nice because looking down like 
the houses were like this big and we were like having to walk down this giant mountain just knowing we at the end of the day we're gonna have to walk back up um and that was like that was probably the worst walk i did that whole deployment um but we went down there and they the locals thought we were russians they didn't even know who we were they were like what are you doing here like do you got are you guys russian we're like like looking at our flags like we're americans they're like you're who who are americans like they they had no idea who we were they hadn't seen like white people in so long um and we were looking for ieds and it seemed like now you know being a star first class and like deploying at a higher rank like we were wasting our time out there like i I was like a, I'm a master counter IED trainer. I got some, some of that training before I left on that first deployment. Um, and I had like a, a metal detector, like shoving in a giant haystack. I'm like shoving this metal detector in there, trying to find IEDs. There's nothing there, but I had hay and straw, like down in my magazine pouches, like clear to my second deployment in 2013. Like I found hay in those pouches, like two years later um but that mission sucked i didn't even take a picture after we got done and i walked back to the top of the mountain i didn't even take the picture i was so pissed when i got done i was like i'm not taking a picture just give me back in the striker i'm done this sucked it was miserable um but it like a lot of our missions were really just they were just presence patrols walking through downtown tearing um i say downtown you know mud hut city you know not anything crazy um not like kandahar proper kandahar proper that actual like buildings um and terran kind of did but it not really it was the third largest fob in afghanistan when i was there uh just because the airstrip you had kandahar bagram and then T uh, tk was was number three um but it was it was it was a good first deployment i'll say that um just as my first time being deployed um i was the alpha team leader and first squad so i was the first one to walk everywhere we went and i'm glad luckily i didn't step on anything we did lose a couple guys that we lost two guys in my company that deployment um but they were both up at the cop um just because we didn't have we didn't have p-tids up at the cop where they could see from there we had it on tk but up at tabar they didn't have the PTs where they could like overlook their AO. I mean, the, the perimeter of, of cop to bar was, was double strand Constantina wire or triple strand. Like it wasn't even walled. Um, and they were like out there in guard towers that weren't even towers. They were just like pallet buildings that they made uh, looking at barbed wire. I mean, that was it. We had a lot of standoff. It was built in a pretty good uh, AO um, up on a hill, but like not not such an easily identifiable terrain that they i mean they could have called for fire in it but we didn't have really an indirect fire threat uh up there because the province itself was like very progressive um we held the first elections ever in that province when i was there uh in 2010 and we only had like one incident at a polling station um that was like a you can't even call it a riot. Um, it was a little uprising, I guess. Um, but like women were voting, like it was, it was crazy. Um, and we were there in strategic locations, not at the actual polling stations. We pushed the Afghan police there, the Afghan army there. It was, we were making Afghans the face of the political movement in Afghanistan. Like this is, I will I will say like that deployment was very good at the hearts and minds, if you will, um, campaign um, where we got the Afghans out there it, leading their own country, policing their own country, defending their own country. Um, 2013 was not <laughs> it was not bad at all. Well, and the thing that's interesting to me is, you know, 2010, 2011, I've talked to a lot of folks who were in the country at that time and they have a very different experience and yeah obviously ours gone was a, a, just such a different zone and, yeah and it's a lot of things that you know i think that's what we were looking to do right is yeah. peacefully be able to pass over power 
but that wasn't the situation in places where you know the Taliban really cared about holding the territory, like in yeah. you know parts of Helmand Province and Kandahar Province that they had yeah. you know family ties to. They were mm-hmm. not going to let you know the ANA have a presence there easily, yeah. and that's why we lost those areas. You know, yeah. and you wouldn't have been able to do the things that you did at that time frame in mm-hmm. other places. And I still think you know it's really interesting. You and I had talked about this beforehand, but one of the things that they trained you on was the ROE. And I've always Uh-oh. thought that like the ROE really tied your hands behind your back. And you said yeah. that you were kind of apprehensive about it because of the amount that they have just really drilled into you what those ROE were. Can you talk about that and how it yeah. felt to be told that like, no, <laughs> you will not yeah. be doing these it, things. It was, yeah, uh, really. And like, uh, in a sense, it was good. You know, like, because you got a unit that just came back from Iraq where the ROE was any military aged male out after 10 p.m., 11 p.m., kill them on site. You know, like, you're taking a unit that was just under that ROE to a hearts and minds, you know, like, be for the people ROE. You know, we need to, like, a counterinsurgency, a real counterinsurgency fight. Um, so it was like positive identification. You had to have positive identification um, and maintain positive identification of what you were shooting at. If they went around a corner and dropped their gun and came back out, it could be the same person. And we weren't allowed to shoot them knowing that it was that person um, because at that point they weren't a threat. They weren't doing any a hostile act. That was the big thing. Hostile intent, hostile act. We had to check those blocks. Um, and the first time I ever got shot at um, – it was August 23rd, 2010. We had finished our initial objective. Um, we d- it was a big clearance mission. Uh, the whole company was out there. And we, I mean, we got brought up. It was up all, out of cop to bar. I stayed up all night the night before. I was so nervous because I'm like, oh my God, this is like a real thing. Um, and I remember we got done with the first part of our, our mission and we got a, a, a frago, you know, a fragmentation order to like, go now check this spot and we weren't prepared to do it <clears throat> excuse me um i didn't have my gps there was a whole bunch of things i didn't have my little my garmin 401 on me so i couldn't plot the 10 digit grid my squad leader sergeant ellis was so mad he's like d what are you doing he gave me his um <clears throat> so we're <laughs> I got the I got the GPS. I got the ten digits where we needed to go. We hop in the strikers and we go to our new spot. I dismount. I get out and I'm like looking at the GPS. I don't even have it on my wrist. I think I like clipped it to my my plate carrier. And I'm walking along and I remember there was a guy digging like it looked like a giant grave. I don't know what it was, some root cellar or something. He's just down there, you know, just just digging. Um, and I, I noticed him, and then in front of me, there was a wall. I was at the corner of a field, and there was two walls. One went this way, and one went across, and it was just open right here. Obviously, I got to walk through there. Um, knowing what I know now, that was like a terrible idea. Um, but with a guy being right there, like, I probably still would go that way. Just, that was a funneling, canalizing area. Like, it, counter IED in me is like, don't do that. Um, yeah. So, oh, want you to go. yeah, right. Yeah. We're lazy Americans. They, that's why IEDs work. Um, so I lead the, the whole platoon into this wide open danger area. Um, and it's, it's a plowed field, but not like freshly plowed. Like the dirt's all dried up and stuff. There's nothing, no vegetation or anything at this part of the field. Um, and I start walking, like I, I, take the really wide into this field so I can fit the whole squad and then follow on the platoon. And I'm walking and I'm looking and I, you know, it's just like, what am I looking for? You know, I'm just looking at anything. So your mind's like, and I have ADHD as it is. So like, I'm like all over the place looking at everything. And like, I mean, in a split second, the whole world, like, fast forward like it's the only way i can describe it like i remember walking and then the next thing i know i'm in the prone on fire like looking through my acog scanning and i like come to and i'm like in the prone i'm laying down and i'm like looking 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 and i my platoon leader 
uh, Lieutenant King's like, open fire. So I'm like, Roger that. So we just start just death blossom. Um, and it's like a cornfield, probably 150 meters directly to my 12 o'clock right in front of me. Um, so we shoot a little bit, like not nothing crazy. And I get my 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 fire team i'm like all right let's bound up because i can see a ditch directly in front of me maybe 20 meters so i go on safe all three of us i only had me and two other dudes in my team we were really we we, when we showed up to the deployment we had a whole squad get detached from us so we only had first squad third squad and then a little bit of weapons which was only like two machine guns um so we didn't have a full platoon but um i run and i get into the ditch and my PL gets up there with me and the Bravo team gets up in there. Actually, my PL is not with me yet. My PL went to my left and there was another irrigation ditch that was on the left side. Well, when I looked left, I see a giant fertilizer bag. And I'm like, fuck, that's an IED. Like that's, it's an IED. I'm like, it's homemade explosives. Like, so I don't have a radio because our unit... <laughs> We had strikers, so like we had to get stuff for the strikers. Our dismounted, our dismounted stuff wasn't funded very well. Um, so I am yelling to my platoon leader, but I'm down in the ditch and he's in the other ditch, perpendicular to me. So I'm grabbing rocks and I'm throwing them to the T intersection where my ditch intersects with his, so he could see how far up he needs to move. But I'm hitting this bag that's 25 meters to my left, and I'm just throwing. It's so stupid now that I think about it, but I'm like trying to, I'm like, sir, I'm right here. I'm right here. So he comes around. I'm like, sir, that's gotta be an IED. Like it's gotta be an IED. So he like goes, he like hops over the thing, gets to me. Um, we, he's coordinating on the radio with the squad leaders and stuff. And we pick up and like, we clear through, we have uh, air weapons team. We have two, uh, age 64s, two Apache helicopters, um, moved to our position. Cause now we're, we're in a tick, a, a troops in contact. Um, and they follow the guys. They see him in the cornfield. They lose sight of him. And then they see like three dudes exit the cornfield in different clothing than what they sh- went in with. So they can't do anything about it. Um, so they follow him. And they're, you know, like we get all the intel, like what's going on. And we're like, well, we know the threat's gone at this point. So we, we get out and we start, we, the the there's a massive compound to our left on the other side of that irrigation ditch um luckily they weren't full of water because that would have really sucked um but we like surrounded that compound we like ran in there guns up like and we're segregating everybody in there men from the women searching everybody i I had the bats and hide was the thing like i had the bat um i had to carry i had the bat and i had the uh the the gizmo which is like a metal detector i was carrying all this crap because we didn't have any dudes um yeah so i'm like i'm like i'm batting everybody so i'm like fingerprints iris scans all this crap all the information though my name is muhammad abdi habib and i'm like oh my everybody's this name you know like um of course never got a positive hit on anything related to what was stored in there um i mean that system was good in theory but it was more of a cumbersome pain in the ass than anything else. Um, but like, that was it for us. Like, it, like maybe 10 seconds of gunfire and in 12 months, like that was all I saw. Um, and that was in August that day though, Justin Shoecraft was driving one of the strikers. Um, we were, we had already got shot at, everything was done and we like heard it on the radio. Um, like, hey, there's a, and I heard him call it the nine line for a medevac. Um, and we got pulled to go provide security for the bird to come in. So we book it. Everybody's running back to the strikers, get the strikers, get loaded up. And then I'll never forget, like, popping out the air guard hatch um, and seeing, like, we didn't know who it was at the time, uh, but seeing a litter, a, a, somebody getting carried on it, and then, like, wrapped up in one of the, 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 like the foil blankets. Um, and there was a whole bunch of crap that came out of that. His seatbelt wasn't working. It got signed off to go on on the mission. Like, so there's a whole bunch of like PL platoon star got fired, like all, like a bunch of crap happened. Um, uh, but like that was like the first loss 
that we had. Um, and it was crazy because like for us, it was a happy day. Like I remember after we got out of the ditch and like over to the compound and we searched everybody. I remember Lieutenant King came coming up to all of us in first squad and like patting us on the back. And he was like, congratulations on earning your CIB. You got your combat infantryman's badge now. And we're all like, ah, you know, we're like, this is what we came here for. Um, and like, I like that is probably what in my military career, like the day I got my CIB pinned on me is probably like, the proudest day of my besides CIB pinning is probably number one. Number two is like earning my drill sergeant hat. Like when I got my hat and got like, that was, I was born to be a drill sergeant. Like I was just like, it was, you know, I was destined for that. Um, well, but I, that was. I want to hear a little bit about that before I hear about the rest. <laughs> so when I, my first day in basic training, it's uh, September uh, 25th. 2008 i rem i can't believe i remember that um i got to bravo company 119 infantry fort benning georgia and i i see all these drill sergeants and they're they're screaming at us and everything and i can't fail tattooed on my knuckles um i had all my tattoos before i joined the army so like i showed up and everybody's like how long were you in prison um for the record <laughs> never been in jail, never been arrested, nothing ever. Uh, I got all my tattoos in the tattoo parlor, believe it or not. Um, but I, uh, I was like in awe of the way the drill sergeants, and these guys are my age. They're all staff sergeants. Like I'm 23, like they're all my age, but I'm seeing just like the way that they got just like the motivation they gave us like the inspiration that they and like the way they changed my life and like how they pulled me out of things like mentally that i never thought i was capable of like the the, the one week in basic training i got super sick at 103 degree temperature it was the last week that we were like doing training and it was like the big train up where we're out in the field the whole time i lost like 15 pounds in the infirmary. I couldn't eat anything. My throat was all swollen. Long story short, I like showed up the last day. I had to do the final row march back. I'm like getting back there and all of my platoon mates were like, Mike, my nickname was rainbow bright because of my tattoos and basic training. The drill starts came out with like rainbow bright, you know, kids nowadays don't even know what that is. But I, I, uh, I show back up. They're like rainbow bright. Like, yeah, dude, you're back. And like, it's 15 miles, 12 miles, something. It's not crazy long. I mean, now it's not, but back then that was the longest ever, but like the camaraderie and everything that the drill sergeants like taught us, it was life-changing for me. Um, and getting us all to band together, band of brothers is the number one reason I joined the army. Um, and that whole camaraderie and everything, watching those guys in easy company, like that's what I wanted. And being in basic training, the drill sergeants were the ones that gave it to us. And that's like, from that day, he wasn't even my drill sergeant. He was a redheaded tattoo drill sergeant. And I was like, I want your job. Like I, that my first day in the army, I was like, I want to do that. So then, uh, eight years later I did, um, I became one, but yeah, I, I, that's not yeah. the story I expected. I expected to hear you say something about getting screamed at and, uh, you know, oh, I mean, that like, happened too. Yeah, that happened too. That, that's a good, I like that. That's really cool. Yeah. And you got to do it. I, yeah that. yeah it's a good yeah it was yeah it was i mean it was it was always something that was in the back of my mind like um that first deployment like you know a whole bunch of craziness happened like on a on a more micro level i got moved out of first platoon i got sent to the headquarters platoon my whole drive like just deteriorated i was in a team leader position i got moved out to be my commander's driver like because some dudes got promoted so they needed that experience of being a team leader over me because i wasn't promotable uh, i was a specialist but they were spe uh, specialist promotables so they were getting ready to make sergeant so they needed that job um and i had a loud mouth nothing's changed um i said what was on my mind um i defended my my guys um i had my squad leader's mother passed away the first month of that deployment so I, as an E4, was put in charge of the squad over an E5. Uh, in the striker world, it's, it's weird. The gunner is a sergeant position, so they put one there. Um, 
and I was in charge of him because he he wasn't very good. Like I'll well, I'll, I'll say it like this: he sucked, um, and they couldn't trust him. So I got put there. Well, being a specialist, my dudes were getting more guard shifts than the other two squads. They were getting shitty details. They were getting the guard shifts, and they were getting like the the night hours, you know, when they should be sleeping. And like I'm not about that life. Like when in charge, be in charge is what I was always told. So like. Yeah, I might be 24, 25 years old and just a specialist, but like I'm the same as you right now. Like the squad leader put me here. He's a staff sergeant. I'm a staff sergeant right now. So like I said some things that like, you know, I, I couldn't, I didn't have the rank to say, we'll say, um, standing up for my guys. So my platoon, I mean, he, he was, he was all within his, his realm to, to fire me. Um, I wasn't really fired, but like, I'll just say I was fired to make it easier. And I got moved to the headquarters platoon and I like, I'm answering radios and stuff, you know, like, but I had first Sergeant Paul A. Sarabone and that dude mentored me, um, the whole time. So I drove for the commander, the commander never left. So then I would drive for first Sergeant because first Sergeant was like, you're the best driver of the company. You're going to drive my striker. So, and that was the medevac vehicle is the, the, we call the MEV. So it was me the first sergeant and then the company medic. It was just us three in the truck. Um, and I, every mission that I did with him, it was him just pouring into me, um, just the leadership qualities, things that like I need to do and like ways to be a good, effective leader um, or just playing like movie games where it's like the letter A, pick a movie that begins with A, B, all the way through the alphabet because we're driving for eight hours at a time. You know, we're all, we got to do something. Um, but like first star in Sarah bone, I mean, he became a star major and stuff, but, um, he was like inspirational in continuing my motivation for the army because on that deployment, I got like really depressed. It was monotonous, same thing every day. Um, at the time I was newly married. I got married in April. I deployed in, in June or May. Um, so I left my, my wife for, six months i got lucky came home for christmas leave i got leave right at christmas i was so lucky and then another six months after that um so like having him there as like a mentor to help me out was just like it was life-changing um and then after uh it was probably like i would say like january february march time frame of 2011 is when we moved back down to Kandahar and that kind of like changed everything. Um, we took over a bunch of Canadian outposts. They called them strong points. Uh, we had strong point Ainsworth, strong point Gorgon. And then we had OP 971. I can't believe I remember these names. Um, that is crazy. Uh, OP 971 was just like enough for a platoon to be at. Our third platoon was there most of the time. They were like the black sheep of the company. So like, it was good for them to be out there at their own little spot. Like those are all my boys. I love them to death. I actually went to third platoon after the deployment, but um, those dudes, like they were gangsters. They all, they like Sergeant Cormier. He was another mentor of mine. That was their platoon sergeant. The dude was a, he's the goat. He, he loved those boys and those boys loved him. He was, he was probably one of the best platoon sergeants I've ever seen in my, my whole career. Um, but they were there at OP 971. Second platoon is at, at, at Strong Point uh, Gorgon. And then I was at Strong Point Ainsworth, which was like where our company headquarters was. Um, but like that was that I feel like we were just battle space holders at that point. Like it was a different AO. Um, lots of moon dust. Not like we didn't have it up north like that. I mean, that Kandahar moon dust is terrifying because it's just like you kick it and it's like a crazy dust cloud. And it's like, it's nuts. Um, but we we would do just presence patrols again. Uh, there wasn't as big of an Afghan presence down there. Uh, like there wasn't Ur's gone. Obviously not as developed. Um, the people weren't as happy. Like the a week or two before we went back to Kandahar, we did a whole entire squadron clearance mission, air assault. So we all got put on CH 47s on Chinooks and we air assaulted out um, one morning and the whole as a brigade level, like what well, an exercise. It was real world um, land in this right past the red desert. Like it was crazy. Um, 
and I was the commander's, I was his only PSD because we was dismounted. I was, I was his personal security detail. Um, so it was me uh, walking around with like, I had some 60 millimeter mortars and an assault pack. And I'm just like walking around. I ripped my pants. Oh my God. That was a terrible, I ripped them the first day all the way down. I wasn't wearing underwear. It was terrible. <laughs> um, <laughs> it was so bad. I was like, I stitched them with like the drawstring from my ACUs. Like it, oh, wow. the army teach, taught me how to sew. So I was like, well, it came in good for something. Um, but that mission was like, it was, there nothing happened as soon as we landed the the locals alerted everybody that we were there they took pots and pans and we're hearing a bang and as soon as we came off the birds and like it was the creepiest thing ever because we were walking into towns where like it was like a western movie where like they they get up on the campfire and there's still smoke but there's nobody there that's what it was like we're going to people's houses and it's empty like like they just picked up and left and there's like pots with like food in it still fires in their houses. Like it's, it was gnarly. And I'm like the whole day, I'm like, we're going to die. Like, this is like, of course I didn't know about like any of the Argandab Valley stuff at this point. I didn't know about like Hornet's Nest or, or anything. Um, even though I had been in the Argandab, I just didn't know it was like what it was, you know, after I came back. Um, uh, but like it was just this eerie feeling like you're in a horror movie and like 28 days later zombies are just going to start coming out like it's just what it felt like uh, but surprisingly nothing happened i walked i walked like over 10 miles that day because my commander wanted to go see every platoon and we were just like on this one big front just like moving from south to north so we walked all the way across the battlefield um, and then that night we shot off all the mortar rounds I had cause they were illumination mortars. I was like, dude, we, I'm tired of carrying these. So we shot them all off. Thank God. Um, but the next day we like moved finally into a populated area. Um, and we took over like this man's house. We threw him some cash and, uh, we were like, Hey, like we're going to be here for a little while. So like he moved out. Um, and we made it like the, the company headquarters. And I remember an EOD dude, they found an IED and, uh, he, who was like disarming and it blew up like in his face. Um, and like we, I, I'm pretty sure he got, like, got on a bird and I'm pretty sure he was stable, but I don't know what happened to him out. Cause he wasn't like part of our unit. It was like, uh, it was just an, a, an attachment that we got to help us out on that, on that big mission. Um, but while we were there in, in Kandahar, we opened a school, which was super cool. Um, we went down to the opening of it, uh, and it was it was gnarly because we had to like walk there. Um, so I remember like we we walked from I think it was from Gorgon. I walked with the commander down there, and it was like the it was like the one cool thing I remember doing. I remember like we got there to the school. We didn't go in it, but we were just there like as a cordon, making sure that nothing swirly happened. Um, and I remember like seeing all the kids with their little backpacks and like notebooks and like Kalam, there's a Kalam, Kalam. They always wanted pens from us, but like they got like, I don't know, probably like six or seven pens like in their backpack, like, like that we gave them. And they were like so happy, like drawing tattoos on them and stuff like that. It was super cool. And that was like, the whole deployment, like the humanitarian stuff that we did was like, like that was cool. Like being able to like legitimately help them regardless of like why we were there. Like there's nothing wrong with being a good person. You know, like there's, there's nothing wrong with like making somebody else's life better. I, when I was a drill sergeant, I always say this saying like, when you wake up every morning, you, you should strive to be a better person that day than you were when you went to sleep the night before. Like, and if you can go to sleep that night saying that I'm a better person tonight than I was this morning, then like mission accomplished. And I think that's like a lot of like what we did on that first deployment, like it was feel good stuff, you know, like digging up, providing engineers to dig a well for them, you know, like provide an or is gone, providing security for them, like letting them have their first election is tough. And then when we moved to Kandahar, even being there, like opening a school for these kids to go to, like that was it's life changing for them. Now I'm sure it's all gone now, but like, then it was cool. You know, like it, at least for a, a, a sliver of time, those kids got like a little bit of goodness. They learned something, you know, like 
whether whether they got to go there for a couple of years or like six months or five years, ten, whatever it was, like maybe they're still going. Who knows? Um, but like seeing the smile on those kids' faces was like it made it all worth it. Um, all the BS of that like very easy deployment. Now when I get into the second deployment, it was nothing like that. But that deployment was like it was a good first deployment that prepared me for the inevitable hell that I would experience roughly two years later. Yeah. I want to talk about that. Um, you know, it, it sounds like total night and day from, yeah, oh yeah. which is so interesting. And, and one thing we talked about before we started filming, you know, you were in RC South. Now you're mm-hmm. going to be in RC East. Mm-hmm. Everything changes. And the reason that it changes a lot of the time is the, you know, the Taliban members who are supporting those different demands, right? So you've mm-hmm. got, you know, the Kandahari Talibs who are in Southern PAC controlling yep. RC South, but you've got the Haqqani network usually controlling RC East. Yes. And they are known for being absolutely brutal. So yeah. let's talk about Mordak province in 2013. Yeah. So I, uh, I left Germany um, in 2012, uh, like July, 2012. I, I went to the re- reenlistment uh, to the career counselor. And I'm like, I, who's deploying? Like I'm an E5 now at this point, like I made Sergeant and I'm like, I'm, you know, I'm ready to go. And he's like fourth brigade, third ID is deploying. I'm like, where are they going? He's like, I'm Afghanistan. I'm like, bet when he's like March done. So like I, no bonus, no nothing. Like I I'm trying to go back. I didn't join the army to like, not when I was a drill sergeant, this is what I said. My job was I kill people who kill people because killing people's wrong. Um, and I, I loved, I'll get into it, but it, it's like a, a God complex. Um, so I, I get to Fort Stewart, August of 2012 and it's fast and furious. Um, because these dudes just closed down Iraq third ID did doing absolutely nothing um like i'll say in general they're fat they're lazy they're apathetic they don't know what they're getting into um and i think at that time only four or five of us had been to afghanistan in the entire 130 some man company there's only a few of us that have been to afghanistan luckily enough my buddy joey sophia who was like one of my best friends was in 2scr with me he was in third squadron though and they were the ones that were in Argandab River Valley. They lost 13 dudes in his squadron in that deployment. Those dudes, they got it in. I'm not We did not get it in. So he's a hardened combat veteran. He shows up, comes to my platoon. So me and Joey, we're both rocking our 2CR combat patches. We're like, yeah, dude, like, let's go. Um, so the train up is pretty good. Um, we, we're doing a lot of, uh, like, wide area security stuff, like, we're getting, um, they're doing pretty good training. We're not doing any close quarter mark, uh, battle stuff. We're not doing like any of that crap. Um, they kind of let me and Joey, since we had been there, uh, they kind of let us do our own training for the platoon. I initially showed up as just a team leader and then just like some movement changes. I turned into first squad leader. Um, so I was first squad leader. Joey was second squad leader. And then my buddy, Patrick Kalush, uh, took over weapon squad. We only had three squads. The total platoon was only about 20, probably at the smallest 22, the max, like maybe 30. Um, when like the MTO, like the required numbers, like 34 to 35 total, we were not there. Um, but you fight with what you got, not what you want. So um, we our train up is relatively good. We go to JRTC, we do, uh, which is down in Fort Polk, Louisiana. Every unit has like a pre-deployment, like, validation they have to go do ours was just down in louisiana because we're light infantry um and we we do pretty well i'll say um we it seemed like it was going to be like my first deployment it seemed like we were going to do a lot of stuff with the afghans we were going to do a lot of this key leader engagement a lot of hugging and kissing you know all this all this crap not war it's what it seemed like initially um so we're like okay, great. Um, we, you know, we're rehearsing key leader engagements, rehearsing using interpreters because some of these guys never used interpreter, like the platoon leader and stuff. Um, so it's, we're doing what, in my opinion, was very good prep 
for what we thought we were doing. We got told we we're going to be on our cop for three months. We're closing it down. We'll move to another cop, close it down. We're retro retrograding everything in Afghanistan. That's what we got told. We're retrograding everything. We're done. Like we're, we're, you know, we're cutting sling load. Like we're done. We're, we're going to be in Bagram in, in four months, chilling, going to the gym. <laughs> no, we show up. I'm the very last group that leaves Fort Stewart. We leave. It's my whole squad. Luckily, um, we leave, I go to uh, Kyrgyzstan, where we always go to Manus, which was dope because I show up and it's like, oh man, I remember this. Like, I remember this one little defect. They have all the candy stacked because it's the Air Force. They have all the candy stacked up and like rippets and like all this crap for my first deployment. So I'm super stoked. Um, and I remember we we left there and we flew in a fob shank. Um, we flew direct to fob shank. We didn't go to Bagram. And we land at Shank, and it's it's up in elevation compared to Fort Stewart. It's like 200 feet in Savannah, Georgia. Um, but it's nothing crazy. Um, so we're only there for a little bit, do some orientation stuff. I'm like, bro, I've been here before. We buy our our Afghan uh, like fake 511 like patch jackets, like so we can look like operators, you know, we're just regular infantry dudes, but we think we're so cool. Um, so we're there like a week or two. Um, and we get birds to our cop because you can't drive there. And I'm like, whatever. Um, for, I did a little bit of homework this time though, prior to the deployment because live leak, was around youtube was around um which really those websites went around in 2009 2010 when i prepped to deploy so i find a video on live leak of wardak province and it's cop bad getting blown up by a 20,000 pound v-bed um you might still be able to find the video i if i like spend some time i could find it the first thing that hits it is like 10,000 pounds is a jingle truck that blows up, it blows the gate. The next thing is an 18 wheeler full of homemade explosives. It blew up, It when it blew up, it blew P-Tids out of the air, which it like, it was crazy. There's a video on a dash cam, like there where they set the camcorder on a, on this uh, Afghan's uh, dashboard. And when the shockwave hits the car and it's, I mean, they're like way zoomed in. He like zooms out. You can't even like see anything. The shockwave hits the car and knocks the camera off the dash. It was, it's the biggest blast I've seen. Um, so I saw that. I sent it to everybody in the in, in the platoon. I'm like, yo, boys, this is what we're getting into. Like it's serious. Um, but I show up, take my flight, you know, out to the cop, and I show up and like, thank God, they met me at the HLZ because it's at seven thousand feet. I am sucking wind. I'll never forget. I've got like two duffel bags, my salt pack, my ruck, and my medium ruck, and I'm carrying this stuff. And I probably made it 50 feet, and I like dropped everything. I was like, <gasps> like it was. I was not used to that elevation. Oh, wow. um, but we get down. They they get me to the platoon like compound because it was crazy. Each platoon had its own compound, and now I'm a squad leader, so like I'm in I'm in Burton now. Um, so I had like my own room. I didn't have to share it. Like it was us three squad leaders back there in our little tent. Um, and I get in there. Our very first patrol that I go on, we're, we're walking this ridge line to the south of the cop. And I have, it's on my YouTube channel. Um, I'm standing there and I ha I'm, I'm Billy Badass. You know, I'm this Afghan war vet, you know, woo. I got my foot up on a rock and I'm standing there, collapsed low ready with my M4. I'm left-handed. That's why I'm holding it like this because I'm weird. Um, and I just hear this like pop noise. And I'm like, and like you can see it in the helmet cam. I'm like, I'm looking around. And I thought we had pin flares. So they're like these little, they're pins basically. They're about that big. And you, they have a firing pin in them. So you screw the, the flare into the top. And you pull down on it and slide it. So now it's off safe. And then you let go. And that firing pin comes up, hits the flare, just shoots up. It's like a tracer going up in the air. That's all it is. Well, it sounded like that. And I look over at the at the 240 gunner that's to my right. I'm like, 
was that was that you did you like negligent discharge like that i, I had no idea what then ping, again right over my head and i'm like i'm getting shot at right now i'm like oh my god so then i get in the prone and i'm like yelling i'm like it was at me like i'm i was getting shot at that was at me i have no idea where it came from to this day i have no idea i like, watched the video again like in my my helmet cam to see if i could figure out where it was from I had no idea little did i know like what that would lead to the rest of the deployment i mean that was the first mission we did i got shot at i would venture to say that eight out of 10 missions that we did following that we were in some sort of gunfire um or ied um it it i mean like i remember one mission we so we the big thing so we showed up and our mission was to support the Afghans. Um, they would go out in sector. They would do a presence patrol, which was very half-assed. Not like the boys down in, in Oregon. Like them dudes like patrolled. These guys were just, they were, as the Haqqani, like these dudes did not mess around. Like they, the Haqqani network was, they're second to none in Afghanistan. Like they just, they did not fuck around. Um, so the guys were scared. So when they went out, they would not like, they wouldn't get in anybody's business. Um, I remember we did one real big mission and it was to this village that we come to find out was named Hafta Siab. Hafta Siab was, they had a mosque. We called it the arms room because we would watch them. We had PTIDs on our cop, luckily. Um, we would watch them go in with PKMs and RPKs, RPGs. Every, you name it they would go in there and like they would walk in with the weapons and then they would come out without the weapons but we can't do anything because it's a mosque um i mean we i mean positive identification weapons ammunition every i mean like i don't need a warrant like in the united states if we saw some stuff like that it's crazy um but when we were there doing a uh a mission like just a clearance operation and we told the Afghans to open this door to this house, like this, it's like a storage part of this house. And they're like, no, it's locked. And we're like, we don't care. They're like, no, we, can, we we're not gonna, we're not gonna, we don't have a lock to put on. We're like, we do. So open the fucking door. And like, we're getting, like, we're getting into like, it's becoming about to be a physical altercation between us and the Afghan army. And they're like, no, we're not doing it. So my boy Joey goes up there, pull he, <laughs> and he never carried a camel back. He had bolt cutters in it. He pulls the bolt cutters out, cuts the lock, kicks the door, and he's like, because we were not allowed to go into any building unless the Afghans went first. That was like the ROE for that deployment. Like we are not allowed to go in. So like we're not gonna go in. So we made them go in. Them dudes took one step in that room. It's dark. They took one step in there. Look left, look right, walked out. There's like nothing here. And we're like, right then, that's when we're like, these dudes are so full of shit and they're not, they're not here. They're not about that life. They're not here to like do anything. They're here to not die. They're here because they know the Taliban is like that guy standing over there, but they won't tell us that. Like they know that's who he is and he's watching them. So he's making sure like they don't do anything crazy. Um, but a lot of those type of events started happening. And then I actually, I think I had gotten blown up or something. I was on a flight, a ring route flight. Um, and we stopped at a, at a, a checkpoint out. It was nighttime. So I don't know what it was, but when we landed, I was in the back of a CH 47. It was me, this, um, SF 18 Delta, this SF medic, um, and like one other person and they like kill the engines and everything. And they're like, Hey, we're going to be here. There's a ramp ceremony. And we're like, what? So we get off the back of the CH-47. I'm like smoking a cigarette or something. And um, I see a door open and I can see the American flag on draped over a coffin. And I'm like, flick my cigarette out, like go to attention. And like they line all the way back to the back of the C this other CH-47. And I'm just like, holy shit. Like, because we hear about KIAs, like. If they're anywhere in our AO, we, we're blackout on the cop. Like, we can't say anything, you know, like, till the family's notified. Um, and I'm like, holy shit. Like, that's like, oh, man. Like, it's shitty. Like, I don't know the guy, but it's like, it's an American. So I'm like, that fucking sucks. 
I get back to the cop and it was it was either the colonel or the sergeant major. Like, because one, there was a colonel that was, was green on blue, and then there was a star major that was green on blue. And it, he was one of them. I think he was the colonel. When um, was, that? was that early 2013? Uh, yeah, probably. I like, because we got there in March. That, because that made international news. Yes. Like, yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, it was. Yeah, when that one happened, and that's when everything changed. Yeah. Uh, and that's yeah. when it, well, that's when it got heard. fun. Let's talk about that. Yeah, so everything, you know, everything went on its head. I got back to the cop. It took hours, it seems like, to get back on those because you know they just—it's like a taxi cab. It's like a a city bus, you know, just stopping at every place. Um, yeah, I got back to the cop. I I get back to my platoon. I'm like, yeah, dude, like there's a KIA man. I just saw him. They loaded him up on the bird, dude. And I was at this checkpoint, and they're like, you know, we're all like, shit, man, like. And like you, it, you have a connection regardless. It doesn't matter. Marines, Navy, Air Force, Army, like American or not, like you see that and it's like a NATO ally. Like I've been on ramp ceremonies for my first deployment for Aussies getting loaded on their freedom bird. Like I've been standing there on the airfield like it. And you, I mean, you can't help but get teary eyed. Like, cause that, that boy, that girl died for their nation, you know? And you're like, like that could very easily have been me or one of my boys. Um, but I remember after like that next day, uh, Captain Hamill, who was my commander at the time, that was his eighth or ninth deployment to Afghanistan. So he was former Marine enlisted recon, um, made E5 in the Marine Corps and then went like blue to green, um, came to the army commissioned went to 10th mountain deployed with them to Afghanistan after already being in Afghanistan, like three times with the Marine Corps goes with 10th mountain. Then he goes to Ranger regiment deploys with the Ranger regiment, I think three more times and then deployed. Then he came to us as our commander. So the dude shows up tab scrolled. He's a real Ranger, like got this, got the scroll to go with it. And like, so was our first Sergeant, both they both our first Sergeant was in operation Anaconda in 2002. He jumped into Afghanistan. Yeah. So like, wow. We had like really good leadership. Like when I say like though, there's only five of us that been in Afghanistan, our first sergeant jumped in, you know? So like we had some experience there uh, and the commander was a prior regiment as well. So like, it was, it was awesome. Like the best, that was the best company leadership I ever had. Um, but I remember Captain Hamill pulled all the squad leaders in above. He pulled us all into like the little MWR room and he like briefed us. He's like, Hey boys, shit's changed. He's like, just came down the pipe. He's like, no more joint patrols with Afghans at all. Zero, none. Um, he's like, we're everything we're doing, it's on our own. He's like, if there's Afghans in sector, like, great. But like, we're kind of like the boys are, we're back in business. You know, like we're, we're here to do what we, what all of us signed up to do. Um, and it was, the gloves weren't off. Um we had to use, I'll say like courageous restraint, um, like very, like we had an ROE, we didn't go out there just killing people. Um, but like, if we needed to kill somebody, we could like, it was like, like hostile intent, hostile act, boom, like no questions asked, ice the dude and like move on that you weren't going to get the the 10th degree. You weren't going to get like all this crazy, like questioning and investigations, for killing a bad guy you know if we were out there killing innocent obviously that we'd be in Leavenworth right now you wouldn't be talking to me <laughs> um but we uh we started we started doing some some crazy stuff that i'm not allowed to talk about um that we didn't sign ndas or anything but like um we started being able to catch crooked people so if things were placed and i'll say this things might have been placed in places where we could have people find them and then we could see what happened to those things and then our company intelligence team would look on a computer and see where hotspots were that looked like a doppler radar and then we would go raid those places um and we found huge caches 
of homemade explosives, indirect mortars, artillery, like just all kinds of stuff. We were able to start now tracking battlefield circulation of munitions and personnel and like where everything was coming from. And so like we're talking like the Haqqani crime network, um, they're a militant group, but it's a crime organization and they're buying and selling things like there was Chechenians in our AO like that showed up and there was a whole conflict between the Chinese and they were driving petroleum trucks, like retrograding things from down south, like Fab Gosney and, and down south of us. And all of a sudden these trucks started getting shot up with tracer rounds and lit on fire because the contracts were originally a certain group of people and they lost those contracts and now they're going to other people. Those people are mad. So they hired mercenaries to come blow these vehicles up. Not that I know any of this for a fact. This is all speculation, of course, but like, you know, if it were to happen, maybe that would be how it would uh, happen. But that summer became nuts. Um, we started I remember the first big IED that the engineers hit uh, because our primary mission was keeping Highway 1 open and secure. Um, so we were responsible basically everything north of Fob Gosney all the way to Fob Airborne. Um, our battalion was responsible for. So we would do route clearance missions all the way down to Fob Gosney, which was, oh man, 40, 50 kilometers. Um, and that was just south. That didn't count the ones north that our alpha company would do because they would go from airborne to us. And then we would go from salt and kill down all the way to Gosney. So we go through the gates of Gosney, um, which was super weird, like this weird, like archway. Anyway, separating Wardak and Gosney is pretty cool. It's very mountainous, very miserable to walk. Um, but we'd have to do it all dismounted because it was all command wires that they were blowing us up with. It wasn't pressure plates like down south. So we had trigger guys out there, mile long leads on this copper wire, thousand meters sitting out there with, they would use cigarettes to initiate. That has enough power and like electric lighters to send enough charge a thousand meters through copper wire to initiate a blasting cap and then blow us up. Um, but the first, the first big IED that we hit, my buddy Jason Millsap was in it. I'll never forget it. I was the first truck. We were QRF. I showed up. And I'm like, I, I mean, like my first deployment, we saw some IEDs, but like nothing like this. Um, it was an RG31 that had a mine roller attached to the front and the RG was completely up in the air and the mine roller was underneath it. And like all of the windows were like cloudy because they have like, it's double pane windows. So it like, when the positive pressure from the IED goes off, it like, it doesn't shatter the windows. Um, it just, it just weird it like turns them all cloudy um and like we get there and the truck is mangled i mean like mine rollers all like just it's just nasty um and i'm walking down the middle of the road because now we're cordoning off the area like the engineers because the engineers are out there by themselves when we started the engineers would just do these patrols by themselves um but i'm like walking up and I, you know i've got my little m4 and i'm walking up i got my radio and i'm like i'm like Hey, are those dudes, <laughs> the first guy I see is an engineer. I'm like, it's my buddy now, Jason. I'm like, Hey, are all those dudes alive, man? He's like, yeah, I'm fine. I'm like, wait, dude, you were in that truck. And he's like, yeah, bro. Like, and he's just like too relu. He's like, like, it's another day in the office. And I'm like, bro, how dude? I went up and hugged him. I'm like, holy crap, dude, that's nuts, man. He's like, yeah, we're all good. Like, I was like, oh my God. And then we go up, we're looking at a blast hole and everything. I mean, the whole road's gone. Like it's a double lane highway. The whole road's gone. Um, and I'm like, this is like, this is crazy. Like I, I never saw anything like that. In my first deployment, I mean, it was like, we call them toe poppers, you know, like little pound, five pounds, 10 pounds of HME, like nothing. Like you might lose a foot. Like you're not even going home off that IED. Like we're going to put you in the talk and you're going to run the radio, like nothing that's going to like do what this did. Um, but I'll say that was like, that was the start of all hell breaking loose um we i remember we, so we would do these route clearances and we would when we first started in the engineers would go and then it, they started getting shot at and blown up so then 
they wanted the uh, infantry men to go with them to be their security. So they started dismounting from the the ECP, the Entry Control Point Road, where it intersected Highway One. We would get the 16 truck convoy on the road, stop, dismount, and we would start walking 16 kilometers down. So we started the 485 and we walked to the 24, 24, 23, 22 North. I think it just depended on what grid square we decided to stop at. And there was points that we would mount back up for a few hundred meters, maybe a kilometer or so, but like it was a 16 kilometer movement like most of the time so we're walking 10 miles and when we first started it it was one squad would walk all the way down hit the turnaround point and we would walk all the way back at like no rest no night over no nothing like and me and joey we were the two squad leaders that would dismount and i'm like dude i can't keep doing this i'm walking 20 miles on a mission like and like we weren't wearing anything we were wearing body armor helmet m4 210 rounds like but my saw gunners carrying his you know 18 pound weapon plus his 200 round bandolier and maybe a couple hundred rounds on him because we were relatively close enough to the trucks that like if we really got into it we could get back to the trucks we could reload all magazines and stuff um so we didn't carry like m4s carry full combat loads but our saw gunners we didn't make carry it's just too much weight for them to walk that far um but me and joey were talking and i'm like dude why don't we just have a squad walk down and then when we hit the turnaround point you mount i'll dismount and i'll walk back so when we walk half of it um and we were the only platoon that would do that like the other platoons would like leave their dudes out there and like i'm not going to say we were smarter than the other platoons but like common if common sense were common everybody would have it and at the end of the day i need to be at my my hundred percent for that day just in case in the event that it's the worst day of my life. And if I am walking 15 miles and that's when I get into a gunfight, I'm not going to be at my best if I had only walked five. Um, so we cleared it with the commander. Like, can we take a little bit more time at the turnaround point? Well, you know, have hundred percent security and all this, but like literally it'd be like the driver gets out. He's walking now. The gunner gets out, but like, it's a one for one driver gets out. New driver gets in, but he was just walking the gunner. He gets out, new gunner gets in, puts the, you know, the heart, the IED, like the little four point harness on. And like, I mean, five minutes, we are, we are turned around and ready to go. Uh, we got it down to a pretty good battle drill, which it, it came to like help because we were at the turnaround point one time we had swapped out and this is still early in the deployment. I'd say it's like, man, eh, June, July ish. Um, and I had gotten out of the truck. I rode the whole way down. It was my, I'm walking back. Um, and all of a sudden we just, this machine gun just opens up on us and we're kind of like caught with our, our asses out. Um, like uh, we weren't down in any sort of like defilade or like down in any kind of like covered position. It was just super flat out there. Um, and I remember running, I saw this ditch on the far side on the east side of the road. Um, that was maybe eight to 12 inches deep. Like not, I mean, like. But I can hide behind this AirPod case if I needed to, you know, that would provide whatever. I'm going to get small. So I remember running and like baseball sliding into this ditch. And I I'll never forget watching rounds like skipping off the road and off the dirt. My he wasn't even my gunner. His name Chestnut Chestnut ran, tripped and his face smashed into his saw. And it just I mean, just blood everywhere. I thought he died. I thought he got, I thought he got shot in the face and I'm like, no, nah, Chestnut, you know, like, but he was fine. <laughs> but like, and Chestnut, he's a good looking kid, you know? So I'm like, God, man, we can't like mess your face up, dude. Like you're a handsome guy, you know? But uh, like, that was just like one time, like that we we're out there and like it happened. Um, and it seemed like it, even when we expected it, like it, it would still surprise us. Uh, our first sergeant, first sergeant Wirtz, uh, he literally just retired, made command sergeant major, and he he just retired a couple months ago. Um, he was with our platoon, and he was walking with my Bravo team leader, uh, Monty Armentrout. And Monty and him were just walking along, and I think Fleming was out there too. Um, and, you know, we're walking. We're just shooting the shit, you know, whatever. And boom, 
they hit a um i don't know if it was it had to be command at um it was a bunch of mortar rounds it's like six mortar rounds um all together by this tree and we didn't meta i don't believe we medevaced any of them we might have medevaced Wirtz back like joe might have took a bird back to just to our cop um but in like he was he's fucked up but he wasn't like was shrapnel or nothing um but a few days later he was running on the treadmill and started coughing up blood and it come to find out ruptured one of his lungs he had no idea ruptured one of his lungs as soon as they found out he was at shank and back in long germany like that like he and then was home and he was you know and then First saw Mulally came down. Um, he was he was at E eight promotable. He's gonna be a star major. And he was the operation star major. He he like took a demotion in the sense to come be our first sergeant. Um and he came down there uh and it did a, an amazing job. He 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 was he was great. He was a great fit coming in there behind Wurtz. But I mean it was just like nobody was nobody was uh safe from it. Um and then June first. It was the worst day of that deployment. Um, we we got a mission to go fill a prior blast hole, and it was it was the whole road was gone, and um, it was it was supposed to be an easy like 24, 36 hour mission. Um, go down there. We had some assets come in with a big eighteen wheeler with this crazy like foam. Never seen anything like it. Pour foam in the hole. They pour this other like chemical in there and like this the, this crap hardens to hard as concrete like almost instantly um so we go out there we go down at night because we can't go during the day now because the ied is blown up or just if we're out there during the day we're going to get hit um so we're out there like that whole morning into the like early afternoon get the blast hole filled in we're all good to go and we turn around to head back north we didn't get any small arms fire nothing the whole time um and we hit just south of this village called Abneray and Joey squads dismounted um and they get lit up i mean just crazy just crazy gunfight i mean it's just it's nuts well Joey and his whole squad shoots their combat load so they're like dude we're so tired we have no ammo like you got and i walked down so i was supposed to be just chilling right back um and i'm like fine and like we only have like six kilometers left to go like 6k 4k something like that left i'm like screw it dude i'll, I'll go like so i hop out the truck my boys we, we do the whole routine my squad gets out my my alpha team leader and the and the i don't know if my platoon sergeant was out uh it might have been the pl or on the on the west side of the road i'm on the east side we're walking north and uh I, we had the engineers with us. They were clearing. Um, I was in the back of that fire team. Um, I had my radio. My, my team leader did not have a radio. That's why I was with him on that side of the road. In case anything happened, I had a radio. Um, and I remember like I got into this orchard um, and I'm all by myself. Um, and I hit this barbed wire fence. Well, I can't like climb over the fence because it's just the way it was spaced and I couldn't fit through it because I'm wearing all my body armor and crap. So I pull out my Gerber and I'm like, I'm cutting this fence. So I'm like, you know, just like whatever. And I cut the first barbed wire and I cut the second one. And, I, and all of a sudden I hear boom. And I'm like, like, no, actually I made it across. I made it through and it, I crossed, there was a road right there and I made it up the other side. And that's when I heard boom. And I, it was like the movies. I just like, just kind of like airborne, like went backwards. Um, and like, I got up, I was like, I didn't get knocked out or anything, but like, it just like the explosion, like knocked me back and I get up and I, and I never like, I was a turd. I never like carried my rifle. Right. I like let it hang by my side or I like carried it like pointing up. Um, so like it wasn't attached to me <laughs> so like i'm like when i got blown back my rifle was like i had to like go get it and i like, grab it and i'm like i come on the other side of the road and i see cameron uh, i see derek he was my bravo team leader 
and at, I have it. We're all wearing earpieces. That way, we, our, our radio chatter was like super quiet and stuff. And uh, I'm like, they're, everybody's like, "What's going on? What's going on? What's going on?" I'm like, "Hold on!" Like, I don't fucking know. Like, I is an explosion, like RPG or something. I don't know because we had just 15 minutes earlier already got into a gunfight with Joey Squad. So I'm like, it's the same dudes who just repositioned is what I'm thinking. And I get up there and I just see a plume of smoke and dust and i'm like i see derek and he's like out of his mind and i'm like who is it who is it and he's like it's ray and ray was my number one dude in my squad um i me and joey talked him into re-enlisting to go to germany he had just re-enlisted i was going to send him to the board to make sergeant he was a specialist he was like my best dude in my squad like he was like my little protege that i was like grooming to like he was he it's crazy because he was a rehabilitate rehabilitative transfer from second platoon to our platoon um because he was like a a bad kid or whatever he showed up to my squad zero issues always on time always in the right uniform fresh haircut boots looking good like like just crushed it um and i as soon as he said that like i like i just about crumbled um and I had, I remember I had my rifle in my right hand. I'm like almost dropped it. Like, I'm just like, oh my God. So I'm like, I run up there and I see there's another casualty. Um, and it's the engineer. And he's like, he's like, it's weird. Cause they were going through a field. There's a tiny little ditch. And then it went up to a, a short wall. Well, where the wall was, where Ray stepped over, it was a cutout in the wall. And we're lazy Americans, so they know we're going to go right there. Um, and it was the first pressure plate IED that we had encountered that deployment. And Ray, when he when he stepped over the wall, he was looking down. And I won't tell you how we know that, um, but he was looking down and he had his weapon slung and it just blew like straight up. Um, and when I got up to him, like he was he was kia on the spot he didn't feel a thing um so i'm like and i'm doing everything i'm not supposed to do i'm like standing right there where it blew up and like Derek grabs me he's like sergeant d sergeant d there's another one right over there and i'm like okay bud don't fucking go over there like what i hold on man like let me get my bearings because the radio is blowing up in my ear like everybody wants to know and i'm like hey there's two wounded one expectant you know because we can't say ki over the radio mm -hmm. um and i'm like i need a medic well, our medic is in the back truck in the back of the whole convoy. So Monty and Doc Leda run like two miles to us, full kit, like with this aid bag. Like I when they got there, I thought I think Monty did puke. Like it was like it was like the Mogadishu mile, like they ran to get up to us. Um, but as we're waiting, I'm like, get everybody pull security and everything. I tell Cameron to pull everybody back. Like Cameron had already stepped over the other spot in the wall that was cut out. Um, but when he looked down, he said, he's like, sorry, D, I remember what you said. Like I saw disturbed earth. So I stepped around it. Sure. As shit. There was 50 pounds of HME buried under there. Like he, like if he, if he didn't listen to what I taught them, like prior to the deployment, like I would have had two KIA right there. Um, because Derek and Ray stepped over at the same time, like Ray, stepped over and Cameron was looking at him when he did it. He like looked down and then looked at Ray and that's when it happened. Um, <clears throat> so, so waiting for the medics to get there, I went and grabbed the engineer. His arm was all dislocated. So I like, I like moved his arm up and like got it back into place. His whole face, like when Ray stepped on the ID, it just blew that whole wall and all the earth because Ray was above him. So it blew it all right in his face. So he was like, it was kind of funny. I mean, he's like, he had sunglasses. So like he took them off and all right here is like a really bad suntan. Um, it was all dirt except for right here. And his whole mouth, his whole tongue, everything was all dirt. And he's that, uh, his tongue was, he's like sticking his tongue out. But like he had fluid coming out of his eyes, out of his ears. And I was like worried at first because it's clear fluid. I was like, he's got brain damage. Like we're screwed. I'm sorry if you heard that this town at 10 o'clock has a horn that goes off it's for curfew and it's been around forever That's and it's crazy. i know That's it scared me <laughs> yeah but um so i got the engineer 
okay got him some water even though we're not supposed to give him water but he was fine like it was just positive pressure that he took the lungs were good he stayed on the deployment but that day like losing ray was like a turning point for us as a platoon that was the first uh that's the first injury we had of the company um the first loss we suffered um but was not the last um as the as the deployment went on later the next month our first platoon um took the largest it at it was the largest suicide vest uh ever in afghanistan it killed 13 afghans and then um it killed lieutenant russell uh specialist nichols uh specialist welch um sergeant smith um and then injured mo injured like a bunch of people um and then kill 13 afghans it was it was nuts um and that was like that was the defining moment for that that deployment because losing ray ray was loved by everybody in the company um i remember after that mission we got back and my commander came down to our platoon's compound and I'll never, like, you never, officers never seem to really be emotional about anything, you know, which they shouldn't be. They should be the, like the, you know, they, they have to think, they have to be analytical. They have, to, they can't be emotional when they, when they make decisions. That's for us enlisted NCOs to do is like get, put the emotion into it, you know. But I remember Captain Hamill came down and was sitting on a bench across to me. And I remember just like looking up at him and like just tears streaming down his face. And I'm like, damn, like you you're you're feeling this loss just like we are too um and it was like it was bad like um i can't remember how many times i'd been blown up at that point i think that might have been like the first like good one that i i took um but like seeing like our platoon like come together on that like rays from cali so we we got this big sheet of plywood painted a big california flag on it and then we all signed it and then we shipped it back with us and gave it to his parents um we flew them out for ray's uh memorial ceremony when we all came back um i did a gofundme for him to uh, pay for their tickets to come out and stuff um but like the boys in first platoon when we lost all them like lieutenant russell had only been there like a couple weeks um and a dude on a donkey um like we were out doing intermixed stuff with Afghans, but a very small contingent of them. And um, the guy on a donkey like went all the way through the platoon down in uh, downtown Salt and Kill, and then like hung out in this little clot building, whatever. And when the platoon came back, he worked his way through, found the antenna brigade, so the RTO, the PL. Um, and the weapons squad leader, Mo, luckily he was good. Um, and then detonated himself and killed just, I mean, and it was crazy because St. Andrew, God rest his soul. He was a casualty of after war. Um, he was in our platoon initially and we fired him out in sector. He's our medic and he, he was fat and slow and couldn't walk. We're like, he got kicked and put in my truck and I'm like, I gave it, I gave him the third degree. I'm like, dude, like if your ass can't stick with us, like you're a liability, not an asset to us. And like, if we need you, like we need you out there, whatever I said to him that day changed him because he went to first platoon and became their medic later on. And he was the medic that treated all them dudes and saved a bunch of those boys lives that day. Um, and like hats off to him because he crushed it. Like he did a mass cow by himself, no help, Afghans and Americans, like, and the, like the PA and the first sergeant ran off the cop down there to like, it was, they drove like the little gator, like the John Deere gator, like that, it was nuts. Um, but like from then on, nobody was allowed within a hundred meters of us. And it was our whole, our, again, our ROE changed. So after that S vest went off, no one was allowed within a hundred meters. Um, and we shouted at them. So it used to be like shout, show, shove, shoot shoot to kill um it was shout then shoot no shout show our weapon and then we shot to kill that was it um 
like no questions asked it because it was just it was too dangerous at that point like we could not risk losing anybody else we had two companies of combat engineers go combat ineffective because they took so many casualties from ieds like doing those route clearance packages like they just kept we there was one vehicle i was the sog i was sitting in the talk they had just left um the they all pulled out onto the road stopped all the dismounts got out everybody was like getting in their positions they're all moving back on the road. This RG drives up on the road, boom, blows up, killed everybody that was left in the truck. Driver, TC, gunner, whole thing like flipped over on the gunner. There was no way he was going to survive. Like it was, it was, it was crazy. I put 18 bodies on aircraft that deployment and only one of them was my soldier. The rest were either engineers or outside organizations that were moving through our AO. It was crazy. Um, I mean, just the gunfights, like uh, the the one video I sent you, um, our Delta company element, we had a platoon that came that deployed late because we were just, we were just hurting so bad. Um, they had done a mission out in sector and, and as they were coming back, they had 18 bad guys roll up on little mopeds, uh, which were banned in Wardak. You weren't allowed to be out on mopeds. It was an instant kill. We ROE said we could shoot anybody on a moped. <clears throat> excuse me so we uh we were watching them on p-tids coming up behind the delta company platoon um so we had two a-10s that were on station and a-10s did what a-10s do and burp 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 and just just oh man pink mist um but one dude was not killed so we saw him like crawling to this compound well my platoon is on qrf so we got spun up to go out there we barely leave the cop and we get into a gunfight of our own um and the taliban are on one side of the road we have an ancop checkpoint heading south on highway one and we're on the other side so we like can't do anything they're just duking it out for like 45 minutes i think we all bound over my buddy ben young was bound and tripped broke his finger and went back to the cop and he's which he missed the biggest firefight of the whole deployment. And we still clown him about it. Um, but we had the Kandak commander, Colonel Malinkadink. I'll never forget that guy's name because it's so funny. Colonel Malinkadink met up with us. Um, and like the Kandak, I, I don't know if that's a battalion or what, like commander. Um, he has his own little PSD, which were pretty good dudes. And they come out with us to this, to, out to where we killed all these Taliban fighters. And we're doing tactical site exploitation. So I'm taking pictures and looking at all the guns that are still left because the locals came out and moved everything and like tried to hide it because they sympathize with the Taliban. Um, so we get out there and like, I, I had just got my squad set in a blocking position. It's just my squad. And I light a cigarette and that's it. For the next hour and 45 minutes, it's just a gunfight. Like, it was crazy. We had a B1 bomber that checked on station that was supposed to, cause we, we were out there so long shooting that we were running out of ammo. Um, and it was like dangerously low. Like me, even as the squad leader, I had a mag in my weapon and a mag on my hip and that was it. Everything else I was gone. Um, my 320 gunners had shot all their 320s. So they were just down at an M4. My saw gunners were running low. I had a 240 with me. He was relatively okay, but like we were not, we were six kilometers from the cop. Like we would have to fight back too. And the trucks couldn't get us like we could have done like an emergency like air egress like we could have got air assaulted out of there maybe but like it's a hot a ao like they're not going to come out there if we're still getting shot at unless we took a casualty um so we're out there duking it around with these guys and bone was the call sign of the b1 she checks on station and like they're coming to do the bomb run danger close is 500 meters um, they were dropping this bomb 500 meters from us and like, I'm listening to the radio and I tell all the boys, I'm like, Hey, get down. Like we're getting ready. They're, they're dropping this bomb and we're waiting. And it's, I'm like, it's had to have been a minute by now, you know? So I'm like, I mean, I'm like kissing my ass goodbye. I'm like all the way in the prone and like nothing. And I'm like, I get on the radio. I'm like, Hey, what's up with that bomb? They're like, Oh, bay doors malfunction. They're not dropping. And I, I'm like, sir, we, I, we're done. Like I have, like, I really don't care what you say at this point. Like we got to bounce. So 
best part of the, my whole deployment. I had a high concentration white smoke. My 240 AG, the, the team leader for the 240, had a purple smoke. And then my alpha team leader had a red smoke. So it was the closest we could get to red, white, and blue. And the, the purple smoke from far away did look blue. So when we threw them, it was like America. It was so badass. We threw it out there and like we straight up, like we don't retreat because we call, you know, we never retreat. We broke contact though. Um, and I remember when we, I, of course I was the last one, all my boys, they ran back first. Um, and we slid down this hill and it was into a, a, a field of wheat. And it was just like the movie Gladiator where Russell Crowe's walking through the field with his hands on top of the wheat. And that's like, that was exactly how it was. Michael Toonstar was there and it's in the video. He like, I don't remember if he high fives me or shakes my hand, but he's like, dude, I can't believe we made it out alive. Like it was cause he was there with me for the whole, like after the first like 15 minutes, like he was there the whole time. I got an Archon with V for that. Like my alpha team leader got an Archon with V, uh, but like, I think my whole squad got, got valorous awards for that specific gunfight um it was nuts and and it just like that continued on for all the platoons like we were and then we had another company come out and support us because we were just getting into it so much that uh america company 37 infantry out of fourth brigade at third id they came up to our cop two and started taking some of the missions from us because it was it was so bad that we had we didn't have a day off you were either force pro force protection you were qrf or you were the mission platoon or you were the the uh, route clearance platoon and like you were that's what you were doing every day and i think it was either every three or four days we would rotate and then finally it got to the point that like we told the brigade commander like sir you gotta like we're, like it's too much like Dudes are losing sensitive items. We're forgetting weapons and daggers and stuff. Like, like we could not maintain it. And like brigade commander came out and said, mandatory 24 hours off for just the people on our cop. Like not for the rest of the brigade, just us. Like everybody will take 24 hours off, no guard duties. And of course, like all the other platoons are like, yeah, bro, I'll take another day of whatever. So you can have a day off because I know I'm going to get my 24 hours off. And when we got our 24 hours off, <laughs> we got ground beef. I don't know how we got it on my cop. We got ground beef. We made a cheeseburger, double, double like layered cheeseburger, like uh, probably two feet around and like this thick. And we sat, we had, we had like civilian clothes, like Hawaiian shirts on. And like, we just like hung out and like relaxed for like a night. And it was like the whole platoon, like got together, smoked cigars. That was like our thing. We'd always smoke cigars. Um, and like, that just that 24 hours like helps so much like alleviate a lot of like the problems that we were having like the forgetfulness and it kind of gave us that quick like reset um but the 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 other half of that deployment it i'd say in like august september it kind of started slowing down a little bit i'd say um and then november is when we were like we were done fighting season was over like it was there's 10th mountain came in and replaced us and they were like snow on the ground. Um, and they almost didn't get to replace us because the snow came in so much. It snowed like two feet one night, like, because we're at 7,000 feet. So like we had snow on the peaks of the mountains there until July. Like it was like, it was compared to Kandahar and Oregon. Like it was so hot. It was like 90 degrees, like there in Wardak, like a cool 85, like, Unless you got down in the green zone, like if you're down by the river and stuff, like then you would get like a little bit of humidity and it was not fun. But like for the like rest of the time, it's just dry. Um, but it was, it was, I mean, like I could go on for hours about just the craziness, just even the, like the fuel trucks, like those getting shot. It like darkened the whole sky from all the smoke, from all the diesel fuel burning. Cause they, they, at one point we had like 21 trucks on fire, like, and these are full 18 wheel trucks, tanker trucks, just burning. Um, so I'm sure I have some sort of sweet cancer from that, that will show up later. <laughs> Isn't that the worst, man? Hopefully you can fix the PACT Act by that time. Yeah, we'll see. We'll see. Uh, that's a really, I mean, the, the difference between those deployments really is night and day. That's mm -hmm. 
utterly yeah, it, incredible. Yeah, I, from like the first day of the deployment to my last patrol. Like I got shot at the first mission, the last mission I did, a 2000 pound IED went off and like blew a buffalo out. Like my first deployment, like I got shot at once. You know, it's just, and it's crazy from, you know, 2010, 11, that's like during the surge. So I, I mean, you talk about Hellman and Kandahar, Argandob, like that, it was crazy. Like, but it wasn't for me. And it's, but it's, this, it's crazy because the same era. And then you hear people talk about 2013, they deployed and like, nobody's getting shot at. Meanwhile, we're, I got, I have, I think I, I was blown up either four or five times. I don't even know. When I go to the TBI clinic, they remind me how many times I got blown up because I don't remember. It's crazy. And that, yeah, you're right. Like you had the opposite experience of everybody because here it Mm -hmm. is. Yeah. 2013 is when, like, that's when I left Intel. And I remember we were talking about this beforehand. I've Mm -hmm. heard about this on the podcast before watching the Taliban raise their flag over their negotiations office in in, Mm -hmm. like, Oh, it was, I think it was maybe May of 2013. Mm-hmm. So that's when everything was supposed to be chilling out. And of course, Hakani isn't Taliban, right? So right. Hakani can keep up the fight. They didn't want to yep. end the fight. Nobody no. Nobody wanted to end the fight. The Taliban didn't want to end the fight either. No. They wanted to win. And, right. You know, they're like, oh, the, the Americans are on their heels. And you guys were taking, that's, I had never heard about that deployment before. And that is really. It's crazy. What you guys went through is something else. Um, yeah. It's nuts because even there was I uh, I don't know if you heard the story or not, but the Ranger Battalion Company, they had a mass cow down in Kandahar in 2013. It was like August time frame. Um, and it, I mean, it was big news because they went to go hit this compound and it was booby trapped. The whole front lawn was nothing but IEDs. They lost a EOD tech, EOD K9 um like six rangers um and the craziest thing is is when i went to the advanced leader course in 2014 after i got back i was on guard duty with um gary gordon from black hawk down he's one of the delta operators uh in black hawk down i was pulling guard with his son ian um and Ian wore his dad's KIA bracelet. And everybody in the class was like, hey, dude, that's Gary Gordon's son. Like, you know, Shugart Gordon, like like the two Delta operators. And I'm like, so I'm I'm on guard shift with him. And I'm like, dude, I, not to like, I don't want to be that guy, dude. But are you really Gary Gordon's son? And he's like, yeah, man. And he's like, I am. I was like, dude, like, it's an honor to meet you. I was like, your dad's a freaking hero. I mean, they made a movie about him, you know. Um, and just from us talking he was on that operation that all those Rangers got hurt on in KIA and we were in country at the same time. And like, we were exchanging stories about like that 2013 year that like nobody else in the country like experienced, um, except for like the guy, I don't know, I'm not taking away anything from anybody else. Maybe they did, but like, from what I know, like a lot of people had a much lighter deployment than what, what he and I experienced. Yeah. It's crazy. Yep. You got it all swapped around. Yeah. Time wise, that yeah. I, I don't know. Do you think it was better though because you had the experience of being in Afghanistan? Yeah, with that. Yeah, thing. yeah. And just more experience in the army, you know. Yeah, yeah. I, I mean, I was two two years more senior. I made. Uh, I became an E five promotable, so a sergeant promotable. I made staff sergeant like right after. I think I pinned January. We got back in November, or December of thirteen. I pinned staff sergeant in January, um, and like it. I, I was one of the last guys, you know, that like generation of soldier, like got a real combat deployment. Um, one of my old soldiers now he's, he's forward deployed. I won't say with who, um, but he posted a picture in our group chat, um, of him pinning CIBs on his soldiers now. And he's like, he's like, this reminds me of when everybody just calls me D it went D, Joey, and Kalush were pinning CIBs on all of us, you know, back in 2013. He's like, I was like, he's like, I was borderline emotional, like thinking about that moment. Like we're earning the one thing that we wanted more than anything that sh- that says and shows that we're better than everybody else. Cause that's, you know, infantrymen, everybody else is pogues, you know, we got to talk smack on everybody else, but you know, like th- that's our one thing. And like, it's crazy to see that come full circle, even now in 2024, that it, 
it's still happening. Like there's boys and girls out there right now earning combat badges and awards and like nobody even knows because we're so worried about everything else. And that was the whole reason I even like did my YouTube channel and like brought my helmet cam was to show people. And this is even a 2013 that like, we're still at war. We're still doing things. Little did I know like how crazy it would really be with like the combat and, and just like the gunfights and the craziness that, that I would see on that deployment. But it prepared me to be a drill sergeant and then be a platoon sergeant out in Hawaii and then work at West Point, like that I can share those lessons learned and stuff with, because war is inevitable when it happens, maybe not in my, the rest of my, our lifetime, but maybe future generations have to experience it. And the only way that they can do better than what we did is to learn from our mistakes. Yeah. Well, and, and the things you did well, I've, I have always, you know, my friends who talk about being raised by GWAT veterans, you know, and how that prepared them to mm-hmm. enter the GWAT. And yeah. that's the thing is you saw the thing, right? You saw, yeah. you saw the elephant as my wife yeah. likes to put it. And you know, how, how are you going to train up other people if you didn't do that? And it's really important. And I just, it's been such a pleasure to hear even the hard stuff. Yeah. You know, this is a really important set of stories and it, it marks times in Afghanistan that like, like you said, like we've said a couple times now, they're very different from what yeah. people would think, you know, a deployment in 2013, oh, whatever. Yeah, it was nothing. Even in 2010, hell. Yeah, right. Yeah, yeah. And that's what's so unique about Afghanistan, you know? It's yeah. Province to province, year mm-hmm. to year. Yeah. Everything can change. It depends on where you were, who you were with, what was going on green on blue, mm-hmm. that that whole situation. So yeah. I can't thank you enough for sharing all of those details. And you know, I want to give you the final opportunity too, if there's anything that you wanted to address that we didn't get to talk about. Um I mean, for just the people that are listening and stuff, like just just remember who you are like, especially as an American, uh, and be proud of who you are, like, regardless of everything that's going on right now in the world and in this nation, um, the people that are your neighbors and the people that are close to you and your family, like, they're the ones that matter and hold on to them, hold them dear. And like, like I said before, when you go to sleep tonight, like try to be a better person than when you woke up and then tomorrow do the same thing. And if we all try to do that, then I think the world will be a better place when, when it's all said and done. That is a brilliant thing. In fact, I wrote that down in my copious notes. I have taken so many notes. I don't think I've ever taken this many notes before. Uh, Probably because I talk too much. I'm sorry. No, it was great. You can't learn. It's like you said, you got two ears, one mouth. And I learned way more. But the only reason I understand any of what has happened in this war is from listening to people who fought it. So, like I said, I really appreciate you being so open and honest about all of these things and just talking about what happened. This is so important to get down. And, you know, for people too, who maybe are thinking, I can't tell my story. It's too hard. Or, you know, Oh, I don't want to get into the emotional. Like you don't have to just tell what happened. It's all, no matter what you want to talk about, about what you experienced, it's important. Yeah. Story is important. And so I so appreciate it. I have taken many kernels of wisdom from this and uh, I want to, we don't have a story for the end of this episode. So I just want to close by telling any Afghan listeners who are watching right now, you know, we still want to end every episode with a story about the Afghan experience, because that's what this whole podcast was based around is making sure that Afghan voices are heard as well. Um, If you want to share something, send it to the Afghanistan Project podcast at gmail.com. And Michael, just thank you again for being here, for talking. And um, listeners might not know you are preparing for your transition out of the military. And I know it has not shit to do with Afghanistan, (laughs) but uh, I've had a lot of people talk to me lately about transition struggles. So we're going to, there will be a transition roundtable coming up here in the future. Nothing to do with Afghanistan, except for the fact that a lot of people who are going to be on have, have been there. So yeah. I would love to have you come talk about that. Absolutely. I'd love to. Yeah, for sure. Well, thank you for being here. And, you know, thanks to all of our listeners for taking the time for supporting veterans, service members, the people of Afghanistan, anything that touches on Afghanistan today. Um, Tasha Kaur to everyone, and we hope to see you again soon.